I'm from Intel Corporation. Today we are going to talk about Intel graphics technology. Uh, first of all, let me say a few words about myself. So I, I work as a compiler technical consulting engineer. So most of the time I'm supporting our customers with their issues with Fortran or C, C++ compiler. Sorry, I'm saying Fortran here. <laughs> um, and uh, sometimes I'm optimizing uh, their code and work on the solutions to get um, the performance, the maximum performance from their code. Um, so how many of you are using uh, Intel compilers right now? Oh, that's great. Okay. So and how many of you already tried Intel graphics technology offloading? Hey, not bad. Thank you. Okay, so today uh, we will briefly talk about why it is important to offload the calculations to graphics, to a processor graphics. So you need to understand that today we are going to talk only about integrated uh, graphics processor. So we are not going to talk about GPUs, to, about the discrete graphics. And this technology is just for Intel specific uh, integrated processor graphics. Um, of course, if most of the talk will be about the programming model, about the software and how to write this software. But without the understanding of, uh, of the architecture itself, especially about the um, cache sizes, right, about the number of threads, the number of uh, units, uh, it will be not possible to write efficient code. And after that, we will talk about some hints and tips how to tune our code to get the maximum performance. And shortly, this, uh, discuss a compiler overview, so how our compiler implement this to be offloaded to the graphic. So here you can see how our integrated processor graphics looks on the silicon. Uh, from year to year, from one generation to the other, we continue to increase the area which uh, the integrated graphics actually occupy on the, on the, on the silicon. Uh, so it means that we have more and more compute power and we need to use it, of course, if we are going to, to write really optimized applications and to use all the hardware uh, features which we have. Uh, so that's why the integrated processor graphics is important. If we have it, of course, uh, here you can see only the core processors pictures, but uh, as soon as you know, we also have a, a processor graphics uh, integrated to other line of products of a processors like Celeron and so on. So it's, it's important to use this hardware, but what is the gain we will get finally? Uh, the answer is it really depends. It depends on our code, first of all, on our hardware and configuration. So here you can see uh, the graph which shows uh, that you can get uh, very efficient code and speed up your application at three times if you use the uh, offloading to the graphics. However, it doesn't mean that uh, it always gives you this speed up, right? So uh, it, it, it always some kind of uh, way to find a balance between how, how much work you need to offload to the graphics and how much you still need to execute on the host. So here, if you, if you see this graph, um, zero uh, means that all executions is done on the GPU. So you can see that it's not so efficient if you have a mix, mixed uh, execution on the host and on the graphics as well. Um, and of course, it really depends on your code. So on, on the algorithm itself, which can be uh, well or not really well uh, offloaded to the integrated graphics. So any questions so far here? Just put your hand up and ask. Don't hesitate. So what Intel compilers give us uh, as an advantages of this technology? So first of all, there are really simple ways to implement this in the code. So it doesn't require too much efforts to rewrite the code. Uh, it, the way it works, you can do it using the pragmas or using the API functions. 
So here you can see the way how it is implemented uh, using the API functions. And uh, you just write this uh, simple pragma flow target directive and share the data. Of course, we will talk about this in details a bit later, but here is some kind of overview which what we already have at this moment. The other way is to use the spatial uh, array notation syntax, which allow you to vectorize the code easily, and it somehow uh, similar with the Fortran actual syntax, as you can see. So uh, the advantage of this syntax is that uh, the compiler will vectorize this code easily. And the third way how to do this with Intel compiler, if you are, go, if you are talking about the um, pragma-based uh, way and approach, is to use the OMP, OpenMP 4.0 standard, which became very popular right now since it, it, it helped us implement not just uh, 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 task level parallelism, but also a data level parallelism and the floating to the accelerators such as GPUs, our Xeon Phi solution, and here we will talk about how to, how to use it to upload to integrated graphics. Since I said that it's really easy to port the existing code, here is a simple example, uh, very naive, where we are trying to do the addition of vectors. So it's a usual serial code, as you can see, and uh, first step will always be a parallelization of our existing code. So of course, uh, uploading to the graphics doesn't work with the serial code because it, it, it has a huge number of threads, of parallel threads, and it doesn't make sense to execute a serial code there. Um, how many of you already tried the Silk Plus technology or aware about it? Okay, so I, I, I will say a few words about this. It's actually a, an extension of a language which allow us with, with a three keywords like silk4, silk sync, and uh, silk spawn to, to implement parallelism easily without extra efforts in writing the code. And the, the main advantage is a very nice scheduling mechanism which, which uses tiling. Um, the idea is that you have um, threads, right? And each thread has a task queue or task pool, and in case this queue is empty or is going to be empty soon, uh, well, uh, the mechanism allowed to steal the task from a different thread. So uh, that's why all the, the threads and all the cores are busy all the time. So what's the main idea? And the Silk 4 is just a, a syntax for uh, loops, to do it in loops. I, I, implicitly, it calls it creates a task, and this ta task will be enqueued in the corresponding thread pool. But it's, it's some kind of abstraction, so we can't control it easily, uh, but we can write a code easily. So it always uh, balance between how easy to write code and how easy to control what we are doing, actually. Um, so after you parallelize your code, uh, you can add this pragma flow directive and this means that the code will be offloaded to a target. We will talk about uh, it in more details later, but here is an overview once again. Uh, and the, our possibility is to, to make a so-called asynchronous offload. So the, the first example, which, is, which used a pragma offload, it was, it, it was synchronous offload. It means that um, while we are offloading the code, the host side, is staying and waiting while the, the graphic uh, finish the execution. Um, so when I'm saying host, I mean a processor, a usual processor. When I'm saying a target, it I mean uh, graphics, uh, processor graphics today. So and the fourth way is, is to use the, the special decal spec uh, specifier. And by using this, we are saying, um, but uh, this is the kernel function, which will be later using the API function enqueued for the execution. So it's a different approach, and we will talk a bit about this later. But the main idea is that the floating process 
in general, it's quite easy, and we need to try it at least to see how much uh, benefit we can get finally from this. Um, as I said uh, previously, uh, it's really important to understand the architecture of graphics technology. I'm, I'm not going to, deep, uh, to dive really deep into this uh, since we are not a hardware architects, right? But we need to know some facts about how it, how it works internally. Um, so first of all, here you can see the evol evolution of our processors and the integrated graphics. The key, key message here is that from year to year, we have more and more execution units. And so we have more and more hardware threads which can execute it. It's important to know when you write your application how many threads we have in order to have uh, enough iterations to use uh, it for parallelism. And also, we are increasing the sizes of caches. And since Haswell generation, you can see that we also have the EDRAM, which is uh, some kind of L L4, level 4 cache, uh, which can be up to 128 megabytes. And of course, it gives you uh, fascinating uh, features to optimize your code. Here is uh, the diagram which shows how the uh, integrated graphics looks like for the fourth generation of Intel Core processor. Uh, what is the fourth generation? What is the code name of the fourth generation Intel Core processor? Who knows? Okay, it's what? Yeah, exactly. It's Haswell. So here, this this picture is specific for Haswell, but for other generation which which was later, it looks pretty similar with some uh, some changes, but the idea is uh, is the same. So we, as a basic building blocks, we all, always have a subslice, which consists, in this case, 10 execution units. So how many execution units do we have overall here? You need just to, just to count this, this, and this, and this. Yeah, exactly. So here we have 40 execution units, and each execution unit has seven threads. So overall, we have a huge number of hardware threads, and we need to, to know how to utilize all of these threads and all of these execution units. Well, our um, important thing here is that uh, each thread has the fastest memory in registers, uh, and the size of it is four kilobyte per thread. So in, when we will go to, to write our code, we need to keep this in mind and uh, uh, try to use the local arrays with the size smaller than four kilobytes to fit in, in, in this size. Of course, we can write, uh, we can make it bigger, but it will be not so efficient as it can be. Uh, and when we are talking about the hardware uh, architecture, we also need to talk about the cache. Um, so for, for GPU uh, calculations, uh, in integrated graphics doesn't have L1 or L2 caches. It has only L3 cache, which is uh, shared between threads, and it has, in this particular um, version of uh, graphics, it has a uh, 200 and 256 kilobytes per slice. So on, on this picture, I said that the basic building block is a subslice, which has 10 execution units. So here you can see that there are four subslices, and two subslices is a one slice. So it's some kind of hell slice. So L3 cache uh, has 256 kilobytes per slice. It means 200 to 128 per subslice, right? Um, then there is a last level cache, which is a share, shared cache with the processor itself. So the processor cache, which is a L3 cache of the usual process, is shared with the uh, integrated graphics, and it's called last level cache. Don't be confused with L3, which is private for uh, integrated graphics, and L3 cache which is shared between the processor itself and the integrated graphics. 
And in some versions um, of uh, graphic cards, uh, of uh, graphics processors, um, we have the EDRAM, which is uh, also some kind of uh, extra level of cache between last level cache and DRAM. Um, and it has up to 128 megabytes. But once again, uh, if you are going to write the code for some specific processor, you need to know if the CDRAM exists or not to take it, uh, to take some actions. Uh, starting from the latest versions of, uh, uh, of a processor, we also have a shared local memory, which is a portion of a level three uh, uh, memory. And uh, it allows to lock a hot data in L3 cache. So it exists in the hardware and it is supported in the software. So there is a way in your software how to use and how to lock your data in the L3 cache. So to avoid uh, cache misses in future. It is configurable and it can be up to half of a L3 cache size. So it is 64 kilobyte per half size. Okay, that's it with the hardware architecture. And now we will talk about uh, the programming models we have to implement the floating. Uh, first of all, uh, graphics technology is just for C, C++. So we don't support any other languages, no Fortran, no Java, and so on. Uh, as I said, there are several ways how to implement a floating. One is called synchronous, and it means that when you upload the calculations to the graphics, the host site is staying and waiting while the execution is finished on the target site. The other way is to do it uh, asynchronously, so to not wait at all. The first uh, approach, which is synchronous, using the pragmat directives. The second one using uh, uh, API function. So it is API uh, function based approach. Silk Plus and OpenMP are both synchronous. And it is actually uh, pretty similar since uh, it's, it used Pragmas and Silk Plus and OpenMP as well. So it's the different syntax and the OpenMP is more convenient uh, because it is a well-known standard, right? And the Silk Plus is a specific for Intel implementation. However, um, it also supported by GCC, starting from, I think, 4.9 4 version. So there is a, there is a way to, to compile the code written with Silk Plus, with GCC as well, uh, but you need to enable the special compiler option to do this. An asynchronous way is the API-based offload, and we will talk and show some examples on how it works. Um, so first of all, there are many restrictions with this and limitations with this technology. So we are from compiler version to a compiler version to a new compiler version, we are trying to, to reduce the number of restrictions we have. And the one which is important is that you can put the Pragmas, the offload, uh, uh, Pragma offload target, Pragma, only before the silk for loop. So there is no other way to put it before usual for loop or paralyzed with any other uh, way if you are not talking about OpenMP. So only before silk for. By the way, um, here you can see that silk for is starts with underscore and the capital C, and before it was without underscore. So the answer is because we have a header file where we have a definition of this underscore silk for just for to, to be useful to, to use it. So don't be confused, silk, silk underscore for and underscore silk for, it's exactly the same. Uh, but here is the canonical form. So, and you need to declare uh, the target data and functions with this special attribute before to say that this, this part of code should be uploaded to graphics. What actually the compiler do is that it generate code for a target device and it also generate a code for a host device for the same loop. 
So there is no option that uh, if you compile this code with target offload pragmas, and it will fail because you don't have integrated graphics. So it's not the case because compiler add the extra check uh, that it that for is an integrated graph. Yep. Yeah, it works. So it uses the integrated one. Yeah, it uses the integrated one. So the, qu the question was, uh, does it work if we have a discrete graphic and the integrated graphic at the same time? Does it work and can we upload to integrated, integrated graphics? Yes, it can be done. And here is, again, this simple example with uh, uh, vector addition. So, and here is what actually the compiler and the offload runtime does. So, first of all, we are checking if a target, de target device is available, if we actually have uh, uh, integrated graphics available. If it's not, this loop will be executed only on the host side. If it is, then we are going to execute it and to offload to the graphic. Uh, and we can, of course, pass the data to and from the target. And there are different ways how you can do this. Uh, so one uh, way is just to copy the data from the host to a target. Of course, it has another head. The other way is to pin the data, to share the physical, physical data between the target and the host. By pinning the data, you are locking the page with this memory, and the operating system will be not able to swap this page anymore. So the excessive offloading, uh, excessive sharing of uh, big data uh, can actually result in a performance degradation of the operating system. So you need to be careful with this. But of course, it, it, it will be really faster than just copying the data back and forth all the time. And as a special clause, which is pin in this example, uh, you can also add an if condition. Yep, sure. So there is uh, no possibility to run maybe half the loop with uh, integrated graphics and the other half of the loop on the CPU and parallel. Yeah, there is no way to do this. But uh, uh, more, moreover, um, yeah, it's a really good question. I, I will go back to this later. So actually, Offload runtime, uh, trying to, to set the number of chunks and assign these chunks of iterations to each thread. So you, you can explicitly control it. You can just set the number of threads using the global variable. Uh, but this process of when uh, the offload runtime divides the whole iteration space to a chunks and then assign to, to each thread, it is not controlled by you. So here is very naive example where we, we have a global variable, um, also a function where we are incrementing it. Uh, both are declared with and implemented with decal spec, as you can see. And when we have a silk for loop, it's a mandatory, it must be a silk for loop, no way to do it in another way. And we edit the pragma offload target GFX in out global, which means that we will copy a global to a target and then copy it back to a host. So it, it, it this mean, in this case, we always should have a 56. So it was 55. When we are doing an offload, we are incrementing the value and printing it. So it's just a simple example to show how it, how it works. Of course, we will not have this kind of code in our software, but we can have something like this. So first of all, um, the runtime, the offload runtime, trying to understand if a target is available on the system or not. If not, we, are, we have a backup execution on the host. In this case, we also have the extra if clause where we are checking the do offload for true. 
So if, if it, we define it, everything is fine. By the way, one important thing here is that even if we edit all these offload pragmas, we can still compile the code only on the host side using the special compiler option, which is offload minus. So it will be easy to, to compile the, the code without the target device and without offloading at all, just adding the extra option to the compiler. Uh, so uh, here we are using a pin clause, which means that we are going to share the physical memory between host and target. And here we are saying that the input image should be with the length of image size. Image size is a number of elements. So it's, it's not in bytes, it's in the number of elements of this array. And the uh, offload runtime will take the size off of, of this data and multiply it itself. Uh, after we are sharing the data, so first we, we check if target is available, then we are going to share the, the, the memory, but there is also the out array here, out clouds, so we are going to copy the data back from the target. So in order to do this, we need to allocate this data on, on the target as well. Um, so first we are, we are allocating the memory for this on, on the target. And then the runtime uh, is going to understand how many chunks we need to have and, and assign these chunks to each thread. So it is hidden from us, this implementation. I'm pretty sure there is, a, there is some complicated way to control this, but I'm not going to, to talk about this today. Um, but internally, um, depending on the iteration space, depending on the iteration configuration, like the stride, the bounce, and so on, so it divides the whole iteration space to the chunks, which are less than the chunk count in this case, less or equal to the chunk count, and then assign each, of each chunk to, to a thread, and then queue a task. When we are waiting for the completion of the, of the execution of this task, so we are not going to, to execute the code on the host until we are not back from the um, graphics. And after that, we unpin the data, which is, which is important here, because uh, we are not going to control it ourselves. So you, if, if you put this pragma and the pin clause, it means that you don't need to care about unpinning of this data. So it will be done automatically by, by runtime offload. It's important because in the asynchronous offload, you need to do this yourself. So it's, it will be a different approach. Um, a bit different example where we have uh, perfectly nested seal for loops. It, offloading also works well with this. Moreover, in case we have a perfectly nested seal for loops, um, the compiler will collapse these loops, and we have a two-dimensional iteration space in this case, and each thread will be assigned um, a two-dimensional two uh, iteration space chunk will be assigned to each thread, finally. Um, actually, here, this, uh, this arrays A, B, and C are defined as a pointers to arrays, and uh, again, while doing a we need to, to, set, to set the length of, of it, so it's important. So actually, OpenMP is doing it uh, very similar, but once again, it's a very well-known standard, and it will be implemented in all the compilers, hopefully, soon. It's also a synchronous offload, but uh, there is no seal for keywords <laughs> there, right? So we need to, to make our usual for loop uh, a parallel using a parallel for OpenMP directive. Uh, so here, is a, here are the directives which we need to work with offloading to GFX with the OpenMP. So first of all is a pragma MP parallel for, and we also may explicitly say to a compiler to collapse 
uh, the loops, if we have a nested loops, which is important when we are doing enough loading to the graphics. Uh, the directive for OpenMP is PragmaMP target. It's pretty similar, and you can set a clause as a map to, from, and to, from. It's actually interesting that each time um, some feature exists in the Intel compiler, and then it goes to OpenMP standard, they always rename the, the clauses, but the idea is exactly the same. So it was pin uh, in, out, in, out, and here it's map to, from, to, from, but it's exactly the same idea. So uh, to differentiate somehow, maybe. Um, and for data and functions, also, there is also a directive which is Pragma and PG player target. So here is some kind of a real, real world example of a nested uh, loops where we're working with the image. To be honest, I don't know exactly what is this algorithm doing, uh, but it's some kind of a filter, I guess. So first of all, we need to, to make a parallel loop from this uh, usual serial for loop. We are doing it using an OMP parallel for. Of course, if, if there are some data races or some problems with shared data, it's, it's it's the developer task to, to fix this first, right? So here is a, it's a naive example when you're just adding one directive and everything works fine. Um, so we're adding on P parallel four to make it parallel and we're collapsing the iteration space. Um, and after that, we're going forward and adding the target, uh, OMP target directive. So here it will work exactly in the same way how it works with the silk four. So we will share the data, we will allocate the data on the target if necessary. Um, we will wait uh, for the execution until the execution is uh, finished and so on. The more important thing when we work with OpenMP instead of a silk, silk plus is that, that the default target device is Intel Xeon Phi. Do you know what is Xeon Phi? Yeah, it's our SOAP processor. And uh, of course, by default, OpenMP in Intel compiler is more focused on HPC. And the default uh, target device is Xeon Phi. So you need to explicitly say to offload to integrated graphics instead. And you can do it using these options. Cool OpenMP offload GFX. Don't, don't forget to do this because in, in case you You've written your code. You think that now you'll get the maximum performance and you're waiting to do it, but you're executing it and you see no performance gain with OpenMP. Of course, because it's trying to offload to Xeon Phi and the Xeon Phi is not available and you're just running the same code on the host. Um, here's a different uh, way to, to make an, an offload to the graphics, which is API based. And here we have non-blocking API calls. So in this case, we are not staying and waiting um, till the execution is finished on the target. That's why it's called asynchronous offload. But the idea here is quite different. So in this case, you will control, as a software developer, you will control everything. You will need to explicitly um, call the functions to share the data, and you'll need to explicitly unshare this data after the execution is finished. And you will need to, to care about the synchronization, some kind of barrier. Um, moreover, in this case, if you are using API-based offload, there is no way for a backup execution. So you, you will need to, to write your code using some macros, like define, if def, and so on, to care about it and in case the integrated graphics is not available to execute it on, on host. So, and my lovely example about vector addition is here we are, we are allocating the data, some float arrays. Uh, this, uh, I'll show you. This syntax is an array notation of a silk plus. It's quite similar once again with a Fortran. So here is a lower bound, which is zero, and the total size, which is length 
So it's not the upper bound. And it's also an optional third parameter there, which is tried. So by writing this, we actually initialize all the, all the data, all the elements of the arrays. So then we are going to share it explicitly using these share API functions. And we also need to define a function with deconspect target gfx kernel. So after that, we have a function kernel, which will be enqueued by gfx enqueue for the execution to a GP GPU. Um, the main difference between synchronous is that after we call gfx enqueue, we are not waiting while it is executed. We are offloading one more kernel, which is back at with a different arguments. But of course, to continue the execution on the host, we need to make sure that all of these tasks are finished on the target, right? And for this case, we have some kind of a barrier, which is JFX wait. So in this point, we will wait and make sure that all, all the tasks which we enqueued uh, to a target device are executed and are finished. So when we can go and unshare all the data. Important thing that um, here, if you share the data, you can use the same data for several calls of the JFX and Q. So you, need, you don't need to share it each time like with Pragma OMP target directive. Sorry. Yep. Uh, please go back there. The, the result Because of C as a result in the uh, method before and the call before, and it works, I guess, in parallel, and you don't know when you put C to the second call, and you don't know what's what in C or. I think it's possible. Maybe it's just an example to show how it works. So we, we, we haven't cared about the data race between C in the first invocation and the C in the, in, in the second. So once again, it's, it's uh, your responsibility. It's, it's, it's your responsibility to, to, to yeah. care about this. So yeah, it's a naive example by way from our documentation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's shared. It's shared again. So when, when you say JFX share, it's a shared data. You are not copying to a target. And, and just a, just a yep. Thing. But it was like more to show that you put all these stuff in the uh, in order queue. So you might first execute the first thing queue and then it's finished and you might pull the second thing. No, no. It, uh, the, if you invoke the JFX in queue two times, it does mean that the second time it will be executed later because it has a pool and it's internal, you know, uh, logic how, how and when to execute it. So it's asynchronously. It doesn't mean that it will be in the queue in, in, the, in the order. And, but this GFX wait is no multi, but between the end queue and the wait, I can do some host work. Yeah, you can do this. Okay. But, but you, if you are not using the results of the C, A, and, and B, like like this, yeah. You can add any host data, host calculations. Yep. And just you're using float, and you have the same performance again uh, if you use doubles. <laughs> we will talk about the performance a bit later. Yeah. Yep. Uh, this example is not about the performance. It's about the way how it works. To get the maximum performance, there are some hints and uh, double. Well, on. On graphics processor, the best uh, size of the data is four bytes, so it's four bytes integer or float. Double are pretty slow due to the hardware limitations, and the short types are also not recommended to use. So of course, there are some restrict. Once again, I, I tried to prepare the restrictions and limitation slides, and it was uh, something like half of my presentation. So there are many, uh, many rest restrictions how to use it. Um, for example, just one, one example. Um, in Windows, there is some kind of a timeout, uh, a system recovery timeout. 
which uh, doesn't allow the task to be executed longer than two seconds. And the, in the offload runtime, there is also a limitation that it can be executed longer than 32 seconds. So, and to allow the longer execution, you, yes? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's what I was going to say. So you need to, to set a flag in the register, but you need to know about this, right? So once again, um, refer to, to our documentation for such kinds of restrictions and limitations which we need to be aware of in advance. Um, there is a way also to share a virtual memory, not just a physical memory. So in this case, we will uh, share the address space between the CPU and the graphics. Uh, note that which, this one is available only in the latest version of a compiler, only in the latest version of a processor graphics, uh, which is, hold on, which is the fifth generation. So it, it started only for, from Broadwell and will be in the Skylake, but not in Haskell, for example. So it's not supported. It should be, again, it should be supported in the hardware side and in the software as well. Um, and it should be also supported by the OS driver, which is in case of Windows, is Windows 10 or later. So it, it will not work with, with early version. Moreover, if, that talk, if we talk about the limitation, so the, the versions earlier than Windows 8, for example, doesn't work quite well with this, so it has some limitation as well. So it's better to use the latest operating system. Uh, to use this shared uh, virtual address space between CPU and host, you need to compile with a spatial option and you must allocate and deallocate pointers with spatial APIs. And here is an example on how to do this. So in general, with uh, shared physical memory, which is done by pin clouds in the op open the bit target directive, uh, you can't work with the pointers to pointers in the uploaded section. So and here is an example on how you can do this, but this one can be done only with SVM free. So there are a lot of limitations with pointers inside the uploaded code uh, when you're used with a shared physical memory. There is no this limitation, of course, with SVM, but you need to care about this. Okay, performance tuning. That's great that we, we wrote our code um, and it compiled. So we were lucky to compile it finally, but it doesn't mean that it will be fast at all. It may be even slower than the serial version. So we need to know um, some hints and tips how to make it work faster. So first of all, we need, in the very beginning of, uh, of my presentation, I said we need to uh, to utilize all the threads. So we, ne we need to, to give enough iterations, enough work for each thread, since we are talking about massively parallel um, execution on the um, processor graphics. For this purpose, you need to collapse the loops. So if, if, if there are nested loops, say it explicitly to the compiler to collapse it using the collapse clause in the OpenMP, for example, or if you're using a silk for nested silk for loops, in these cases, it will be done automatically by the compiler. Um, the other important thing when we are talking about the optimization for the graphics is the vectorization. So uh, graphic, integrated graphics also has a, a few and which is vectored, and uh, you can work with eight elements of a float data. So the, the length of uh, registers there is 256 uh, bits, which is eight bytes. So vectorization is extremely important there as well as on the host side, as you, as you know, since it's data par parallelism. There are several ways to force the vectorization of the code using Intel compiler or even any other compiler like GCC or Microsoft and so on. The Pragma CMD or array notation is a way specific for Silk Plus. So in Silk Plus, there is a spatial 
um, directive, which is Pragma CMD, which allows to disable the compiler heuristic and compiler checks of uh, loop and will force it to vectorize it. Even there are data dependencies, even uh, there are some uh, inefficiency in this loop. Of course, uh, you should do it only if you aware as a software programmer, you aware that there are no data dependencies and things like this, otherwise it will crash. Um, we introduced it because uh, there are many ways when the compiler is not able to vectorize your code because uh, it thinks that it's unsafe by some reasons or it doesn't know, for example, that the data is not uh, overlapped, the pointers are not overlapped and so on. So in the past they have something like restrict keywords to, to give the compiler the hint that uh, the arrays don't overlap. Um, but in the latest version of the compiler we've introduced this, this Pragma CMD since it's more powerful way to control this. And you can find more materials online about this. And this was moved to the OpenMP 4.0 uh, standard as well. So in OpenMP, there, there is also the OMP CMD directive, which, uh, which does exactly the same thing. So it, it enforces the vectorization. So use the Pragma CMD to enforce it. And the alignment also is important. So you need to align your, your data. It should be 30, 32 byte aligned. And say explicitly to a compiler that, that the data is aligned using the assume aligned. Um, then, more interesting thing is the GRF, which is the general register file. And I talked in the beginning that each thread has four kilobyte of a, of a GRF file, each thread. So you need to care that uh, all your data fit to these four kilobytes. Uh, to work with a GRF in the direct way, so it supports actually work in, in both way, in, in direct and indirect. Uh, addressing. So to, to work in a direct way, you need to, to make sure what your local variable, one single variable, is less or equal than three kilobytes. Overall, all local variables should be more than four kilobytes. In this case, this local variable will be allocated uh, in JRF. Otherwise, it will be allocated on stack. Uh, this actually requires the algorithm change and uh, usually you need to make a loop tiling or loop blocking to make sure that your data fits in four kilobytes and uh, you don't exceed this. So usually the code like this with the array will be transformed to something like this when we are going by tiles. So we're changing the iteration space and we are not going um, directly from one element to the other but we are going by blocks, and in each block we are not exceeding the size of the cache. It's quite very well known technique to do this. So of course the total size of locals must be less than 4K. Um, okay, there is one also interesting fact, and we'll talk about this later, is that actually um, uh, the compiler doesn't generate the native bytecode, so it doesn't generate the native instructions of a, uh, of a of of loaded device. So it generates some kind of virtual set of instructions and there is a just-in-time compiler which uh, finally execute the native, the native code on the GPU, oh, on the JFIX, sorry. When I'm saying JFIX, it, it, um, it was intentionally done to uh, to differentiate it with a GPU. So GPU with discrete graphics, GFX it's graphics processor, processor graphics which is integrated in, in these terms. Uh, and you also need to unroll the small loops since unroll, um, unrolling results in the direct access to, um, to a GRF. The other thing when we are talking about the performance tuning is that it doesn't work quite fast with small data types. 
So gaseous scatter, gaseous scatter instructions, for example, doesn't work very well with one and two bytes elements. So avoid this and try to, to, to write it. First of all, try to, to work with a code uh, linear with no stride, right? It, it's, it's always be better when the stride it access to a, to a memory. Uh, but also avoid one and two byte elements. So the fastest and more efficient data types on the graphics is four bytes, integer or float. And of course, one more, uh, the alignment is extremely important. I think here with the, the, the statement that again can access up to 1024 bits means that there are four slices and each slice uh, can work for two slices actually on GT3 card, and there are four sub-slices, and each sub-slice can work with uh, 256 bits per one, uh, per time, at, at, at a time, so overall, we need to multiply it on four. Can you see this code? Okay, it's, it's an example of a matrix multiplication, which is done based on these uh, hints which I talked about a few minutes ago. So first of all, we need to add a pragma float with pin clouds to share the data. Then you can see a two nested silk for loops. In this case, uh, the compiler will, will collapse the iteration, uh, these loops and the iteration space uh, will be collapsed to two dimensional. After that, what we are going to do is we are using the tiling technique and the loop blocking technique. So we are setting the size of a tile in that way, that the overall the data is less than four kilobytes. And the size of the data itself of each local variable is not uh, more than three kilobytes. And everywhere we work with a silk plus array notation to be sure that uh, to be sure that, that it is actually vectorized by the compiler. So here you can see uh, uh, array notation. It's also an array notation and so on. So all these loops are vectorized. We are explicitly saying to a compiler to unroll the loops to avoid the indirect access in um, general register file. And that's it. So in this particular example, these steps finally gave us the maximum performance of this, of this simple matrix multiplication. It's a synchronous uploading. It can be done in both way in using OpenMP or C++. Uh, some extra words about how a compiler works with all this stuff. So first of all, this compiler supports separate compilation and linking of target code. So here you can see when we invoke ICC uh, to compile the, the file a.cpp a and bcpp, um, there are different parts, which is the host part and the target part. And the target part will be embedded to a host binaries finally, using the binutils tools. So you need to get a binutils to, to do this. It will be in an ELF format, and once again, it will be a part of a final binary. Um, here is an example. If we compile with the add CPP file and doing a dump of this, we can find a section which is called .jfx opt. And there is also a way to do, uh, to extract this binary using the offload extract tool, which is shipped with our compiler. So after doing this, you will get the add gfx all binary, which is purely um, target binary. So this is how it done in the, in the file, in the binaries. And here is a software stack which we need to have in order to execute our application. So we need to have a heterogeneous application with uh, embedded uh, binaries to be offloaded. And once again, 
the target code is not in the native instruction set by default. However, you can say to a compiler to generate a native code. So you can avoid extra overhead for, for jitting. Uh, but in this case, uh, you need to be sure that you will execute the code on the specific uh, processor graphic. So you can say, say the GPU architecture uh, <clears throat> and specify this. So uh, in addition to a compiler, which provides you a compiler itself and the GFX offload runtime, you need also to install the Intel HD graphics driver, which has a jitter uh, which will convert your uh, virtual instruction set to a real native instruction set. So that's it for today as an overview to the graphics technology. Um, note that all Intel tools are free uh, for the first 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you can go directly on these sites and get a system studio and a parallel studio and the compiler which uh, supports the offloading and uh, using the OpenMP Silk, uh, Silk Plus and Asynchronous is available in the latest packages. Uh, once again, first 30 days are free and you can evaluate it with no limitations on <coughs> functional limitations, I mean. So, um, moreover, you also get uh, premier support and you can ask any questions uh, if you have some difficulties or even found some bugs, of course. And uh, your feedback is valuable for us, so please try and let us know how it works for you. Um, and now, questions. Yep. How do the pragma directives work? Oh, sorry. How do the pragma directives work thread-wise? Can I have multiple threads using synchronous of float? Um, it's for, for queuing yeah, yeah, yeah. different I, I tasks, of course. So if if you have an OpenMP. Um, and for example, four threads, right? And in each thread, you are going to uh, do an offload, right? Yeah. So maybe I have like six threads, and each of them is calling a, a different function that does some synchronous offload. Yeah, that's a good question. I believe it is. It's not supported yet. Okay. Uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure that it will be supported soon. Since, uh, once again, if there is one offload, it will block the execution of the thread, right? And it, it may be not really, uh, so you will have a performance drop finally, because all, all the threads will, you of course have a, a synchronization of the threads, right, somewhere. Well, uh, I guess, uh, uh, so yeah. the, the thing is, can I have multiple threads which are accessing yeah, yeah, the GFX are related to each other. That was the yeah. The point no, of the no, question. it's not supported okay. yet. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I get access to the hardware interpolator or sampler, for example, for BLA interpolation or something like sorry, that? Sorry, sorry. Can I get access to the sampler in your hardware architecture? S so, yes, the sampler. So I might get interpolation for free. <laughs> to a sampler in the hardware. Uh, I don't know about this. Okay. So uh, it's, it's something not related to uh, uploading itself. So in, you, you want to get an access to a sampler. Uh, I don't think we, we have this implemented yet. Yeah. So um, how is the support for the Intel tools like the IPP and um, all these all these fast libraries, um, do they support this natively or is there a special switch that I have to use when I use no, IPP? If you, if, you have, if you have Intel libraries like IPP or MKL or TBB, oh, like, no, MKL, IPP or DAL, the latest uh, data analytic library which introduced, uh, of course we are using all this stuff inside, so you don't need to, to specify any extra compiler options. You just need to link the latest version of the library, and it will use all the hardware features which, which, which are supported on, on, on the system you are running. And this is also 
implemented in some domains. So I can say that all library is optimized to use this feature, but some of the components for sure are using it. The same as with uh, Intel Xeon Phi. Okay, if no questions, thank you for your time. See you.